Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. I'm your host, Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my wonderful co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. How y'all doing, ladies? Good. How are you? How are you? Good, good, good. Just hot. Hot as all get out here in uh, Dallas. It's um, been averaging, what, over 100 here for the past forever, I guess. Is that is that, yeah. is that a <laughs> length of time? I think that's correct. It, but it is cooler today because it's only 97. So I feel like yeah. I feel like my tan's catching up with you, though, Emily. <laughs> my, 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 tan, my tan is catching up with you. I, I'll be there. Give me a couple more weeks and I'll be right, right where you're at. Right? <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. But we got some awesome guests today. And uh, without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Today's guests are the hosts of the Media Path podcast, which takes a deep dive into pop culture topics, including movies, music, television, politics, and more, and has featured such guests as Jerry Mathers of Leave It to Beaver, John Sebastian of The Love and Spoonful, and the Fonz himself, Henry Winkler. He's a legendary Los Angeles TV weatherman who now does stand-up comedy, and she's a podcast pioneer who is also a writer, producer, filmmaker, and musician. Please welcome Fritz Coleman and Louise Palenka. Hey guys! Wow! Wow! The studio you audience is very close to three conscious. people. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's our final. Let me ask you this: How come, you, how come your co-hosts aren't in uniform, Chief? What's going on with this? Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I I gotta send them the basic training first, then uh, we can get them. To oh, okay. <laughs> so they're not military personnel. No, no, they're not. Uh, oh, okay. Well, now I don't feel so. <laughs> but, yeah, but they support. They support the military like none other. We we love our our civil service uh, employees. That they they take care of us. And uh, yeah, yeah, we I couldn't do this show without them. So there you, know, you we'll, go. We'll get them a well, we we'll get them a service, camouflage though. shirt or something. Uh, they, they can put on next time. But, I mean uh, a flag, uh, something. Let's go. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So thank you both for joining us on the show today. We're super excited to have you. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Can you let our studio, well, we don't have a studio audience, but can you let our, our audience in, uh, in, in the metaverse know where you're joining us from today? Uh, I'm well, in I'm Los Angeles. Say, you know, she's, we're, we're, in the, we're in the greater Los Angeles metroplex. Louise is in a town called Sherman Oaks, and I'm in a town called Toluca Lake, which is uh, part of the San Fernando Valley. And we're just slightly cooler than Dallas at this moment. <laughs> slightly. <laughs> <laughs> we're catching up. In an hour, we'll be there. We're doing pretty well. We're indoors. Yeah. Uh, it's a blessing. Oh, yeah. So, Luis. We understand that you'd been wanting to work with Fritz for a long time before he retired from his long career in LA television. So can you tell us how you were finally able to bring him on board for Media Path? Uh, brownies, <laughs> a plate of brownies. <laughs> it's, very, it's very effective. Uh, no, Fritz and I have been friends. What What did you say, Fritz, for 35 I think 30 years? years or, 30 years or right. something like that. And he Since was under he yes exactly he was under contract at nbc as their weatherman so you don't want your weatherman having rogue opinions you just want him to speak about weather systems and patterns you don't want him hawking dog food or what have you so there are certain restrictions on on what he's able to do now fritz as a stand-up comedian was always stretching the boundaries of that because he'd get on stage and say things that had nothing to do with with the weather, but he's but Fritz has been so charitable and such a known fixture around the Los Angeles and a, adjoining counties that uh, they kind of let they let him go. But podcasting was beyond that pale, so we had to wait for him to retire. Okay. And the truth of the matter is, Louise and I have been friends for a long time. 
she, I, I've, I've done a series of one person shows and my stand up shows and she produced two of those. And we've been friends for a long time. And I've always sort of been of like minds talking about movies and books and television shows and entertainment. And we really just wanted to make a podcast that was sort of a continuation of our conversations that we had with one another every day. We would just invite the public in to listen to it. And uh, we talk about books and movies. And for instance, it's called Media Path. So we start the show with uh, talking about a couple of suggestions uh, of what people might watch, like new stuff on streaming this week or a new book that's out or a new television show. And we just discuss. We don't review it. We just discuss it. And then we bring the guests on. So this is really uh, a continuation of a friendship that's been going on for a long time. And we're just inviting the listeners in to kind of join us in our conversation. And it was a really easy thing to do because we'd already had this great friendly relationship for many years. You know, we, we consider what we do sort of uh, pulling boomers kicking and screaming into the podcast age. And so we have a lot of guests that are what I call boomer comfort content. So things that you grew up with are in your heart forevermore. And so we love to have a lot of guests that uh, boomers respond well to or, that, you know, even child stars that you want to just see how they're doing. Is everybody OK? And and it's it's really it's really fun to have conversations, to have all the conversations you wondered as a kid, you know, with, with the folks that, wow, what, what was what was that like? And. And so, and we, so we start by recommending current content, you know, here's what you might want to watch, here's what you might want to read. And then we bring on guests, a lot of whom have, have been in uh, our, our hearts and minds for, for a long time. And now you can find all that content on the internet. It used to be, you have to wait to see if it was going to rerun. And we just love to challenge boomers to just go on these deep dives and, and learn new things and discover old friends and uh, come along for the ride. I'll give you a great example. Last week, or before we went on, we had a little hiatus for summer vacation. We had Jerry Mathers, who was the beaver. Now, all of you were too young to remember that show. But that was that, that was one of two shows I was allowed to watch as a kid. That and the Lawrence Welk show, because it was so it was user friendly. It was the classic American family, and uh, at least in our perception in those days. And uh, And so we had him as a guest, but that wasn't even the best part of it. The best part was his mom came on. Now, Jerry Mathers is my age, and I'm an old person. He had his mom come on with us, and she's 96 years old, and she was so funny and so entertaining. And Jerry Mathers is kind of a, he's kind of a, not socially awkward, but he's, he's, he's quieter. So whenever there was a question that he couldn't answer, he would just look at his mom, and his mom would expound on this question for 10 minutes. She knew everything. She knew all the trivia from early in his life. She knew all the stars. It was hysterical. We had so much fun. That that was that was a memorable show that I won't forget for a long time. That is awesome. That's incredible. Um, and so Fritz, which first of all, yes. love your name. I have a Fritz in my house. He does have four legs, but I do have a Fritz at my house. So I love the name. I was gonna do Fritz for either a kid or an animal and the cat came first. So he is friends. Ooh, but, um, lucky I appreciate the honor. As in the 40 years that I was working at NBC, I would say that 25 people sent me letters and pictures having named a pet after me. Parakeets, iguanas, <laughs> dogs, goldfish. And Fritz is an odd name. You know, all, all the men, I'll tell you how I got the name. Uh, all the men in my father's side of the family are named Frederick, right? Mm -hmm. I'm German and English and I'm a mishmash of a bunch of things. And are, they're all named Frederick. And so my grandfather, my father and I were all named Frederick. Well, when I was young, my grandfather used to call me Fritz, which means little Frederick in German. Fritz! And he would always say it when he was <laughs> mad. That meant he meant business. If he called me Fritz, it's over. It was going to be a bad afternoon. And so that's how I got the name. And I hated it when I was a kid because, you know, it, it's just an odd sounding name, Fritz. It just it sounds like the German word for the sound that Velcro makes or something. Fritz. <laughs> and so and so uh, but, but it's as an adult, it was different, you know, so it stuck. So I kept it. 
And I haven't named it anybody. Is the, it is the American word for this is broken. <laughs> no, that's broken. It's on the print. Yes, that's awesome. No, I love that. And um, that's awesome. Yes. So you do. You can add another one to the collection. Yes, I Fritz. appreciate it. Send me pictures. We would love a picture. Is it, yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> as, as a dedicated cat mom, I have tons of pictures. Costume, I'm, out of costume, <laughs> sleepy, all of that. Wow. Oh, we'll, we'll, but, we'll take all that. We'll post that yeah, on social perfect. media. Send it. Oh, perfect. So... Um, how is this a change from nearly 40 years of weather forecasting, which can be rewarding, but can also result in viewers? So I guess changing to what uh, to Kiana's question. So change from nearly 40 years of weather forecasting, which can be rewarding, but also result in viewers complaining that you ruined their picnics. Mm. <laughs> how do you know? I have a story. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the difference is, and Wheezy perfectly described, and I don't talk about weather now. I can talk about other things because I have opinions about other things. But it's funny that you say <laughs> that because I have a story very similar to the one you just fabricated about me and picnics. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm in a market after the 11 o'clock news one night. This is a true story. And um, I was, you know, it was a bad day at work. And uh, I go in for my bottle of Snapple and a snack. At, at, it, this is a 24 hour market. And uh, it had been a bad day. I had been, you know, having to answer questions to a 26 year old station manager who was my children's age and he was giving me trouble. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm standing in line at the at the checkout counter at like 1145 at night. And this man comes up from behind the gum display and he says, I just want to tell you something. <laughs> I'm a big fan of yours. And what I'm about to tell you doesn't mean that I won't always be a fan of yours, but here's how you've affected my life. About a year ago, my daughter was getting married and we were going to have the ceremony in my backyard. And you were starting to hint at maybe some rain over the weekend. And so I called you up on a Thursday because Friday was the cutoff day for me to rent a tent for $6,000 to tent my backyard for my daughter's wedding. And I called you and you said, I am 98.6% sure that it's going to rain over the weekend. We're at my daughter's outdoor wedding. I would rent the tent. No problem. So it turned out that the storm was a bust. It was one of the most beautiful days in Southern California in a year. And he said, so you cost me $6,000. But the good news is, the wedding photographs were so much more beautiful on a nice day. So I'm not going to sue you for the $6,000 and I'm still a fan. So stories like that happen all the time when you wreck somebody's soccer playoff game or something, but that, that was an issue. Being a, a TV weatherman is learning to suffer public humiliation gracefully. But if you, if you think about the news business, the other newscasters tell you what happened. The weather guy, tells you what is going to happen. So right. I think that he's predicting the future. He should get some grace, some credit for being <laughs> at least somewhat prescient upon occasion. That's very true. S somewhere in the ballpark, right? <laughs> somewhere right. in the ballpark. People, there people was love weather. <laughs> people love imperfection. If you make a mistake and you're humble about it and don't pretend like you never said it was going to be a nice day, say, well, you know, people love that because it reminds them that they're not perfect. So, you know, I'm a flawed person, but that connected me to people. So. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, so media path and chief chat have a few things in common. We're also a yeah. boomer friendly podcast. We, 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 uh, okay. We've we've had we've had our share, fair share of boomers on on the show um, and, and talked about a lot of cool stuff and got the chance to just kind of go back in time and I know I may look a little bit younger than I am but I, I do have a little reference of Leave It to Beaver you know it might have been Nick and Knight it might not have been an original <laughs> but like Nick and Knight just brought me all the way home right sure, that'll do <laughs> yep but but this this show also started during the COVID pandemic and so. Um, mm. Luis, can you uh, tell us what the challenges were about starting a podcast during the pandemic? We also started during the pandemic. I'm right there with you. I think everybody, and I give boomers a lot of credit for getting up to speed on Zoom super, super quickly. A lot of phone calls to grandsons, I'm sure, to get folks on board. But uh, we, we did start over Zoom 
And I think in a lot of ways, just having something to do, having something in your schedule that felt work-like was good for folks. And whether you're listening to a podcast or making a podcast and, you know, just seeing each other's faces was essential during that time period, especially for folks that are extroverts. I think it was a lot more painful for them. Fritz and I are both introverts. So, oh, I get to spend a month alone. Awesome. This is great. No one's coming over. Loving that. But for extroverts, that was like death, you know? And so keeping busy, having things to look forward to, keeping that kind of structure, those were things that I think we were all challenged to put into our lives, to ingest into our lives, to stay emotionally healthy and connected to one another, which, which is so critical uh, for, for and, emotional and she, health. That, that's so true, uh, Weezy. And Chief, another thing that we like, we like our guests to come in the studio. Uh, uh, Weezy at her home in Sherman Oaks has a beautiful four station podcasting station and we love guests to come in because the electricity is there that this is jerry mathers and his mom look at her she's just so full of life I mean, she was amazing anyway uh we like guests to come in because there's more electricity in the studio when you can look in the person's eye and and they can understand your sincerity so it was hard to start the podcast on zoom and we were thankful when uh covid was over so we could have people come and join us live oh yeah Not that's super important. Uh, you know, I, unfortunately, I don't get a chance to see a lot of my, my guests live, but I, my, my first live interview was with uh, the, the group Air Supply. And, and they, oh, nice. they, they're they they're boomers, right? And and they don't yeah. really do this technology thing that well, but they, they came to Dallas and they invited us to a, a hotel conference room to, to do an interview. And that, that was my first wow. live interview in this for this show. Uh, and it was awesome. It was it was amazing. Those those guys. Uh, they're still living the rock and roll lifestyle. Uh, even, yeah. even uh, I think that they're in their seventies, maybe somewhere around there. But um, yeah, who were bands are touring and making a boatload of money? I mean, like the Eagles and the Stones and old guys are on the road yeah. making a fortune right now. So those young Absolutely. bands, the kind of the nostalgia bands like Air Supply and all those. Weezy uh, produced a documentary about the Cow Sills, which is wonderful, and Amazon Prime, and uh, they go out on these. Uh, tours what are they called the happy together tours wheezy where they go yeah, out with all these and they they're have they're yeah. killing right now yeah we i just saw the show in ojai they have uh, different acts every year but they've had the cow sales pretty much i think for the past nine years but it's the turtles put it together and gary puckett was on the tour this year and you know and uh little anthony and people are just so excited to, to return to live entertainment. There's nothing like the sound of live music and then sharing that experience. And so uh, I think you guys are finding it too, where when, when it's finally time to go to a play or to go to a restaurant, everybody's just louder than usual, more engaged, more hugging, you know, but just, uh, we're just so thrilled with each other. And it's, uh, it, we've been through a lot and I think we need to, do a lot of listening, you know, make sure everybody's okay. You know, not just nodding their head and saying they're okay, but no, really, are, are you, how are you doing? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting to talk to, to talk to those, those groups and to see what they've been through, especially comedians too, because that was the most super spreader thing you could do was go into a comedy club where they've got people really, you know, bunched together, low ceilings, everything that's good for laughter was bad for the spread of infection. So it's been a journey. No, but to your point of being an extrovert during the pandemic, that definitely fits my personality. And what I would do during the pandemic, I guess when it was more so lockdown time, was talk to people all day, every day on my phone, but also watch old movies. So that was my first time watching My Man Godfrey, for example, and then also The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly was that was my first time watching that movie ever. So I got to catch up on a lot of classics, which I am a huge Turner Classics movie fan. I know you guys can go. Oh, my God. Yeah. You because I, you're was about. I knew I was watching too much Turner <laughs> Classic movies when I saw Citizen Kane for the third time. They'd been through their whole life. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was crazy. Yes. It's so good to consume. Yeah. Good to consume you. content that you've heard referenced throughout your entire life. Like my next project is to watch 
the Star Trek TV series, the, the original, from the beginning. Because wow. I've never done that. And everything's available to us. So it's just mm -hmm. like pick, pick a project and go for it. No, that is so true. But as I mentioned, your first episode was about Turner Classic Movies. And you're both obviously right. movie buffs. So what were some of the biggest discoveries that you made from Turner Classic Movies? And what are some of the strangest discoveries? I discovered that uh, Scarlett O'Hara is kind of a bitch. And uh, <laughs> I think that's, you know, because it's a name you hear your whole life and you watch the first scene and you're like, she's horrible. So and we're supposed to be strong like her, like, no, she's spoiled. So that was, uh, that was, a, that was interesting. And what else? We both, we both kind of discovered again, a face in the crowd, which is, it really kind of resonates today in terms of that cult of personality that can catch on. Are you guys familiar with the film? No, I haven't Andy seen that. Griffith. Yeah. Andy Griffith is evil in the film. He's oh. kind of like, uh, well, you describe it. Yeah, Matt Yeah. Yeah, Matt Locke. Yeah. He's <laughs> the maniac. <laughs> Well, what I it's noticed evil. on the Earl Turner, I noticed on the Earl Turner that everybody smokes all the time. Wow. There's a lot of cigarettes consumed in old movies. Mm -hmm. There's true. also a lot of it content is, that would it would not be acceptable today. But on, on Turner Classic Movies, they sort of say, you know, we could ban this and say, you know, this is this is not appropriate, but we've decided to just show the movies and let you guys discuss them yeah and yeah like because the, there's the, a lot the woman, that's that's a good point wheezy the the uh the woman that does the late night weekend ones and she shows movies that um are would be deemed inappropriate now and would never be made for instance the jazz singer which has al jolson in blackface and they show some of the old movies not being judgmental about it but not taking it out of the culture because some people might be offended by it, showing it because it represents where America's mind was at that time. And I've learned so much. Those guys are all really great experts on the content. So it's a great way to learn the, uh, the history of film. And uh, people were really articulate. I mean, some of those movies are so smart. I would say to myself, this probably wouldn't even fly now because the language is so uh, good and it's 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 fun. So I agree with you. TCM was was my sidekick during the pandemic, hundred percent. Also, we're all saving a lot of money on hats. They wore a lot of hats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, that is so funny. I didn't really even think about that, but that is true. And so, Luis, um, besides you know movies um what kind of topics do you enjoy talking about most of on media path which covers it covers a lot of territory for sure um so what are some well, of your favorite topics to discuss yeah that's a good question fritz and i both love i can speak for both of us we both love history and we love doing deep dives on history we're both political junkies and and we love history and and we love seeing patterns in, in human behavior and you know how do you keep how do you keep a society and a, and a, and a community in in balance because you have to always kind of factor in that there's going to be you know folks who want to cheat or who want to get around something and you know my husband's a, a prosecutor so i know i understand what you know how a society wants to make a correction when something has gone awry or when there's been a wrong but you see those, uh, you see the global patterns of that, of the, the push and pull of all, you know, most of us trying to do the right thing. And then a few factions in there trying to gum up the works or take something or be unfair or, uh, you know, grab something that, that isn't that where folks are going to suffer. And just those, those shifts in power and balance and community and every, all of our attempts to set up a society, you know, that functions well throughout history, you really, cause we only get to be here on the planet for about a hundred years. We don't, we, we, we're looking at it from our own perspective and it's fun to just pull back and watch these patterns unfold and 
and see and challenge yourself. Like, how could I do better? Well, how could I be a part of folks doing better and getting along and understanding one another, especially in this, in a global where we're able to communicate so much more easily, you know, with folks who have a different background, a different culture, a different, a different, um, country that they, that they live in. It's, it's, we can challenge ourselves to understand one another better through reading and watching. And um, that's what I think that we both gravitate towards. Yeah. And I'll, I'll speak uh, uh, 100%. Um, history is a kind of a, a hobby of mine as well. But I'll tell you what I really love about the podcast. And you, you, uh, you learn a little something every week. That's the fun of doing it. It's just learning things about things that you don't know anything about. But I love it when we meet a guest that we watched when we were kids. For instance, the example I always use is Christopher Knight, who was uh, on the Brady Bunch. And, you know, the Brady Bunch is this iconic television show. And we all have this sort of this predisposed idea about actors. They're shallow and they look in the mirror a lot and they're narcissistic and all that. And then you interview these people in their in their civilian life or their their new life and find out these are really amazing human beings. Christopher Knight happens to be a computer genius. He's like a savant and he knows so much about computers that he started computer companies. He's been he's become a, uh, a, a computer representative for major networks. And this whole side of this child star that we didn't know anything about has had this amazing adult life. Those are the fun things for me to find out a person is more three dimensional than you would get from them just watching them on TV, playing a, a cute child in a TV show. They're many times way deeper than that. And that discovery is always fun for me. Yeah, I, I completely agree because uh, I got a chance to talk to a lot of uh, folks that I, that I grew up watching and and just to kind of, like you said, get that three dimensional picture of, of them and, and just understanding that they're doing some great stuff out there that people mm -hmm. don't even realize it or don't make the media because it's not negative. If it was something negative, then the media would probably blast it all over the place. But uh, mm -hmm. just knowing. Good point. That, that good, point. Yeah. good point. Good point. Who, who's your favorite yeah. guest then that you've interviewed? Ooh, my goodness. Uh, you know, woo. so we, we've had a lot of great Louise. guests. Um, I'm, we'll say that again. You had the rock. You had the rock on there. What, what do you mean? Was that? <laughs> you had the rock on there, right? Did I see a picture I, of the I've rocks? The, line? Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm glad you I didn't had put the rock. my picture next to the rock's picture. <laughs> <laughs> the rock The rock was excellent because we got a chance to actually bring on a uh, one of my former airmen at another duty station, um, her her son is a big, huge rock fan. And so we brought her on and got gave her an opportunity to uh, ask him a question. And it oh, was his birthday awesome. and he wanted him to to sing the song in, from uh, Mo Moana, uh, one, of the movies, one of the movies he played oh, in. That's huge. And so he, so, so rock went in the full <laughs> Moana mode uh, during the podcast <laughs> and directed it to her son. And that was one of the coolest oh. things ever. I, oh yeah, yeah, it was. That's cool. He, he was awesome. He was awesome. That's no, we, so cute. We've had I've had too many to to even count. Uh, That's great. It, and it's hard to pick a favorite because we we we've talked to quite a few people. So we we appreciate them and we just you know we we, we thank them for their time and it's just it's just cool. And not one point in my military career in my life that I think I would be a podcast host talking to you know Fritz and Luis or or The Rock or <laughs> Or, or P Diddy or or Gene Simmons or any it, all the folks that I got a chance to to have a conversation with has been it's been awesome. That's awesome. Uh, it really yeah. is, yeah. But sometimes we, you you find yourself in this conversation and you're you're just kind of like you become twelve year old you just for a right. moment. <laughs> you can't stay there, or you're uh, you know you lose your ability to speak. But yeah, it is it is gratifying no, to finally yeah. get to ask the questions. Yeah, no, no, I'm stuck in my 12 year old me all the time. Uh, so, yeah, so I think just, we are. You know, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I have to snap out of it, but, but uh, <laughs> you know, since this is a big military community that we're we're talking to right now, and we're live on the air, mm -hmm. uh, Fritz, yeah, let's we'd love to hear about some of your Navy experiences and your and your work with the Armed Forces Radio. I'll, I'll tell you, um, 
my Navy experience saved my life. Um, I, I, I'm old enough and some, some, I'm sure nobody serving will remember this period of time, but some of the older folks will. There was a time up until the 70s when we had a draft. And in order to get a deferment from the draft, you had to stay above a certain grade level in college, which was a C average. And if you went below a C average, you lost your college deferment and your name would go in the hopper and you would be invited to come down and interview for a job with the Defense Department. That's what happened to me. I fell way below that. There was no mistaking that I had not cleared the C average when I was a junior in college the first time. And I got the letter from the Defense Department and I lived in Philadelphia. So I went down to 401 North Broad Street to this big facility where all the recruiters were. And uh, I got my physical. And uh, this was a period of time when everybody was, uh, everybody that went in the military, regardless of which branch, except for the Coast Guard, you were fairly certain that you were gonna go to Vietnam. So I thought, well, what are my personal strengths? And one of my personal strengths was not anything regarding crawling through the mud with a gun. I would love to serve my country. I just knew that I would not be at my best were I in that situation, respectfully to those who are brave enough to do that. So as soon as I saw that I was going to pass this physical, I picked up my clothes. All I had on were my socks and my sneakers. And I walked down this line of recruiters and immediately enlisted in the Navy. And it turned out to be the best decision I ever made. I went to Great Lakes uh, Naval Training Camp for boot camp. And then I went to two weeks of electronic A school. Then I was transferred to the USS John F. Kennedy, which was the last conventionally powered attack aircraft carrier in Norfolk, Virginia. And when I got on the ship, we were only the second crew. It was a relatively new crew. Uh, they were looking for volunteers in the public affairs department to work for armed forces. Tell, oh, they, they started calling it American forces television, not armed forces television and radio. And I'd always wanted to do that. I never dreamt in my life that I would ever have a chance to do it. So I volunteered and I auditioned and I got it. And every day I did a radio show in the morning. I, I played 16 millimeter kinescope movies in the afternoon, many of the same Turner classic movies I watched during the pandemic and, uh, <laughs> and other shows. I did newscasts, I anchored newscasts, and I did the weather. And so at the Navy's expense, I learned my career. And the beautiful thing about it was I was really bad. I was really bad. I was embarrassed. <laughs> but the beautiful thing about having an on-air job when you're in the military is if your attitude is good and you keep your shoes shined and your pants pressed, you don't get fired. Regardless of how bad you are, you don't get fired. And that's a gift. In the commercial world, you can't be bad for too long or you get fired. The Navy allowed me to be really bad and to learn for three years. And so I was out of work one day when I was discharged from the Navy and I got a job in radio and I've never looked back. So the Navy, first of all, uh, was, uh, was a gift for me. I was sort of wandering through the world, not understanding where I fit in on the planet. The Navy taught me discipline. And for the first time in my life, it was something, even if I was uncomfortable for a minute, I couldn't get out of it. I had to finish my obligation and it introduced me to my career. So truthfully, the best decision I ever made in my life. I had a great time and I got to do two, what they call sixth fleet cruises. These are Mediterranean cruises for 10 months. Mm -hmm. I got to see all of Europe. I went to Barcelona, Mallorca, um, Sicily, uh, uh, Naples, Rome. I went to the Greek islands. I went to Morocco. I went to Istanbul, Turkey. I saw all these places. I learned to ski in the Alps for free. And um, forget it. I, I am a big proponent of uh, for somebody who's not sure where they are in life to think about the military. So, so did you have a radio name? I did not. I, oh, I was uh, E3 Coleman. I was only an E3. I was an underachiever oh, in the military. You. Chief, I'm sorry to say to you. So I only got out as an E3 because, you know, electronics was too hard. I couldn't I couldn't go up to a to a petty officer rank. But but yeah. I, it was so when amazing. I, when I travel when I travel overseas, uh, I get interviewed by by uh, AFN, so our Armed Forces yes. uh, Network. Yeah. And uh, the 
the airmen or the airmen or, or soldiers that interview me, they all have DJ names now. So if you got if you got a radio show or whatever, they, they come up with their DJ name or call signs or whatever. So uh, yeah, oh, I, I was well, wondering we, if we could see that when I was in. I, yeah, well, I, yeah, I didn't yeah. have so, to do that, but but it was it was an amazing experience. And we 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 were uh, what, what they call a flagship, which was the main ship in the flotilla or in the in the group of ships. There were like 12 or 15 ships in this group. And this is before the days of microwave and satellite and everything. So we would do our TV shows and our radio shows and we would record them on these fat two inch videotapes. Then a helicopter would take them to the other ships in the flotilla. It was real. It was just nothing short of diesel power radio back then. So, I mean, it was it was a great learning experience. But again, the Navy allowed me to not be perfect at my job, but to learn without getting fired, which was a gift. Absolutely. So speaking of the Navy, um, we know that you also did some training at an Army post, um, Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indiana. So since there's an exchange store there, we wanted to know if you have any memories of the PX. I don't. I never went to uh, that was an ex, that was the training facility for people that work for American Forces Radio and TV to go there. I never went there. Okay. I was sent there just periodically, but I was able to take care of the post exchange, you know, take advantage of that because I was a military uh, person and man you could go in there and buy an album, a record album for 99 cents. I bought a complete stereo system when I was in Europe and, and with giant Harman Kardon speakers and all this stuff for like $400. Now it would be thousands of dollars worth of electronic equipment. So yeah, going in the military, just going to the PX is worth it. <laughs> Love that. mm -hmm. That's awesome. So Luis, you also have a radio background. What was it like working for such big broadcasting names such as Gary Owens and Rick Dees? We're guessing that this was after Gary did Laughing and Rick did Disc Disco Duck. <laughs> yes, I, it was after those glory days. So yeah. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I began my career writing writing uh, the weekly top forty countdown for Rick Dees, and uh, the, they had. Kiss FM was Rick's station and the sister station at that time was called KPRZ and the morning guy was Gary Owens and Gary was Gary it, it, Fritz knows Gary he's he's a very gracious man and he loves to share old old Hollywood stories with you and then he'll so he tell you all these scandalous secrets and then as he's leaving your office he'll say don't tell anyone what I just said about Earl Holloman like <laughs> okay, like who, who would I tell? But like, okay, got it. Wink, nod, got it. Uh, but yeah, like he knew, he knew everybody. And there was a certain point where they the the law became such that you could have the same. You didn't have to say have unique content on each of your stations. You could you could just simulcast. So Gary got everybody at KPRZ got fired, but they kept Gary as their like their emissary or their, you know, dignitary. And they gave him an office right across the hall from where we were starting our company called Premier Radio Networks. And so Gary was, you know, they had him come out and at events and everyone was excited to meet him. But like a lot of the day, you know, he was just in his office and I'd if I had a break, I'd stroll over and, and he'd give me advice on comedy writing. He'd take me to lunch and he, he just became a mentor. And it was, which was really nice because Rick Dees was not an easy person to work for. And Gary was quite, quite the opposite energy, you know, very loving, very warm. But yeah, we, me and some fellow disc jockeys at KISS FM started a company called Premier Radio Networks, which is a syndicated radio network, which went on to become now a, a division of iHeartMedia. So I was just kind of like on this rocket ride where I, I just found myself there and I just hung on, you know, as best I could. And uh, I, I just consider myself to be very blessed. Yeah. And also know that you, you got into the podcast game very early uh, back in 2005. Um, what was it that attracted you to podcasting and how far do you think it's come over the past 20 years? So those are all really good questions, because, I mean, I think if we all think about the moment we got our first smartphone where there were apps from there were there were these capabilities, you know, you could get apps from outside developers, third party developers and 
I, I'm that I'm that person that would wait in the mall line, you know, and make friends with everybody in the line to see if, you know, we could get into the Apple store and get a phone today and see what, what does it do? What does it do? I was very excited with what it did. And around that time, if you'll recall, your computer was coming with it, uh, iMovie and, uh, you know, YouTube. So not only did we have these creation tools all of a sudden for folks that are photographers or filmmakers or musicians, we had these creation tools. We also had these dissemination outlets. So it's like, not only could you make a little movie, you could put it on, on YouTube. You could share what you were doing and podcasting was right there. It was like, oh, you want to, you think you're, you think you're delightful. You want to host a show, you know, go for it. So I, I heard the word podcast. I said it to a friend of mine, Laura Swisher, who was a comedian friend of mine, we, we did stand up comedy. And she said, Oh, I just heard about that. You want to do a show together? And we just, it was maybe 2005, we started podcasting. And it was most folks didn't know how, how to listen or, you know, what was going on. But it was that whole concept of like, my dad has a barn, let's put on a show. And, you know, I, I I've always loved the ability to share any kind of creative outlet. It was a a dentist who lived next door when I was growing up and we'd be playing outside and he'd invite us to come in and look at his, his most recent piece of art that he would display for us kids. And, and we go, Oh, that, that's a bird and a tree. That looks great. And then we, then we, I found out this is paint by number. He had a paint by number <laughs> kit and he was, he was a dentist, but he was so proud of it. And that just taught me that we, we just have this need to be creative. Like to make something mm -hmm. and to be proud of it, whether it's what you cooked or your garden or, you know, that you put together some sort of birdhouse in shop class or something, you know, we, we love doing that. And so technology has made it a lot of, a lot easier for creatives to make something and share something. Plus, if I, if I could just tag on to that, uh, I, I, I came into our podcast while she was already uh, well ensconced in the technology and is also, she's very technically oriented. She's also a documentary filmmaker and we do our podcast on YouTube as well. So the real hard work for her, which is done alone by her for many hours is post producing the show, editing in video, still pictures and, and music and sound, making it good for YouTube. Uh, which requires a couple of days of really hard work. So I, I get the benefit of all, of all Weezy's hard work and just show up for broadcast day uh, as prepared as I can be. But she does a lot of work uh, in, in marketing it and getting it getting it visually beautiful for YouTube as well. Fritz, Fritz is not giving himself enough credit. He does a Starbucks run. Yeah, I like Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. When you guys come over, you're going to need to let him know what you'd like. Oh, you, you fly, you fly, I buy. <laughs> okay. That's, me. That's the most important job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, and, and sometimes we have, he's walking in with like, he's that guy with all those, you know, trays trying to balance it. So uh, he's, he's that guy. And uh, yeah, it's, we have a lot, but we have a lot of fun. And we, like Fritz said, it's like going to grad school for free. You know, you get to learn, you get to read someone's book and then talk to them. Like what could be better? No, exactly. So besides Media Path, what other podcasts would you both recommend? Ooh, let's see. Uh, I love any, anything on NPR, This American Life. You know, that's an easy recommendation. I'm always recommending podcasts, right, Fritz? So what am I listening to lately? Did you, did you ever listen like to uh, Ben Mankiewicz's podcast? You know, he's the TCM host. Do you, do you, I, I've forgotten your first name, my dear upper left-hand corner. Did you I'm ever listen Tiana. To his podcast? Oh, Tiana, I'm no, sorry. I didn't even know he had a podcast. Uh, it's really good. He's done a couple. He did one with, uh, he did one with uh, uh, Peter Bogdanovich, a very famous director who passed away. And he's done some really good ones. And he gets really into the weeds about movies and stuff. And it's fun. So I, I recommend that one. And I, I've All been right. listening to Rachel, Ma Rachel Maddow's podcast. Her current podcast is called Deja News. And what she'll do is she'll take an event in history and she'll find the parallels uh, you know, to what we're going, go, you know, we're all living through history, right? So she'll find something that happened, you know, 
100 years ago or 50 years ago that feels similar. And it's a history lesson. Plus, it's, it's you know, helping us better understand uh, a current climate or uh, a current uh, kind of dilemma, you know, that we find ourselves in, not as a nation. Now that's neat. That's awesome. And so, um, Fritz, after you retired from weather forecasting, you returned to stand-up comedy. So mm -hmm. how's the stand-up comedy career going? It's fantastic because we're oh, finally good. opening up. Uh, California opened up in waves. Uh, by opening up, I mean giving people the ability to come and join a live audience for performances and stuff. I have a new special out, a one-hour special called Unassisted Living. It's about getting old. It's on uh, the Tubi free streaming channel now, and you can watch it. Just go to Tubi, type in my name, and it'll pop up immediately. Um, it's it's uh, for people of a certain age, and it's clean. Uh, and, you know, if you're not old, just listen to it, learn from it, and realize that your life will end up the same way I'm talking about in this special. <laughs> so... It's fine. So, and, and, and I'm uh, doing a, uh, a residency at the theater where I take the special. I'm doing one performance a month from August to November at the El Portal Theater in North Hollywood. Thank you for allowing me to talk about that. <laughs> of course. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Go, go check out Fritz. And, and Luis, we, we, uh, we talked about your filmmaking uh, documentary, Family Band, The Cow Still Story which is a music mm -hmm. documentary that uh, more people should see. Uh, what led you to that project? The Cow Seals were the real life inspiration for the Partridge family. So they were my favorite band when I was a little kid and then they just kind of disappeared. And long before the internet, if your favorite band disappeared, they were gone. You didn't, you didn't have any access to it. Uh, figuring out, you know, where were they? Are they okay? These kids were little kids who were like deeply, deeply talented. Uh, rich, rich harmonies and incredible uh, production value. You'd see them on Ed Sullivan and you'd be like, oh my God, how, what, how are they doing this? You know, because they, they were little kids and then they just disappeared. And so as an adult, when you could Google, I guess it was Yahoo, but the, you know, you guys probably remember your first, your first search term. And my, I w my first was, I, well, let's see if I can find the cow seals. So some fans had put together a little website and this was back in 2003 or something. And uh, I wrote in their guest book and a fellow fan said, it looks like you're in LA. You should come to this pub where Bob cow seal performs. And I went, you know, long story short, I, I went and I, I, I realized there's a story here. I was in radio at the time, but I thought, let me figure out how to make a documentary because I think this story needs to be told because it's a story not just about what happens to child performers, but it's really about family and dysfunction and what happens to children when they're in harm's way and when there's no one there to protect them. Uh, and so a lot of folks, you know, I have special features on my YouTube channel, you know, on, you know cut footage and little little kind of special special features that used to get on the DVD. I have a lot of that stuff on my YouTube channel with the cow cells. And so I see all the comments and I see a lot of folks writing. This is just like my family, but without the musical talent. So, you know, the cow cell sort of hit, like Paul cow cell, one of the kids said, you know, we had our dad telling us, you know, that we were the worst thing ever. They had an abusive father emotionally and otherwise. We had our dad telling us, you're useless, you're good for nothing, you're horrible. And then we had all these screaming fans who, who thought we were great. I chose to believe the fans. So in some ways, I think being famous saved them uh, to a certain extent, although children in show business are always need a lot of layers of protection from, from uh, just harm's way. And they managed to survive their childhood, but the career did not come intact along with it. Their dad had just angered too many people because the, you know, the, the kids didn't know how he was interacting with the other adults professionally, but it kind of soured their reputation. So they're facing adult life with no money, in debt, owing taxes from money that they never even got. Their dad squandered it all. And they just kind of had to pick themselves up and, and rebuild from there. And I, I 
I told that story not just because they were my favorite group, but it's just helpful to understand that people sometimes need a, a little bit of grace to understand what they've been through. Every We all have a journey, right? And sometimes we wonder why folks are behaving the way they are or why, you know, this opportunity didn't work out or whatever. You know, ask a couple more questions. Find out what's been going on. What was your childhood like? And, you know, so the Cow Seal story, like, you know, the way that Fritz describes it, it goes all the way from Vietnam to Katrina. It's the story of the baby boomers and it's everything that happened to us. It personified in, in one family. You, you can oh, no, compare it. All, oh. I'm sorry, Chief. I no, just wanted to add to what she's saying. It's a it's a beautiful piece of work. I, I mean, it's it's this thing that we do in America, which is we we hold these families like the Cow Sills and other family bands and, and young performers up and put them on a pedestal. And and many people idealize what they think lives are like. And to find out they're not true. For, the the other example of that would be the Jackson family. Look at this talented family. And Michael had all of his problems, but there's a backstory to all of those problems. How did he get the way he was or how did he uh, encounter the problems he had? And there's some really deep and dark things that these kids had to uh, absorb. And uh, it's really a very touching piece of work. And they're all individuals and they're all in one car and they're all in a closed space trying to go for their own individuality. And it's a really nice piece of work. Wheezy was there with a camera at some moments when they were trying to sort out their family differences and stuff. And it's, it's interesting. Even if you're not uh, a fan of the Cow Souls music, the family aspect of it, the family chemistry is worth your look, I think. Oh yeah, no, it's, um, it kind of touches back to on the point that uh, I think, I think Louise made earlier about just understanding, just getting an understanding of, of people and and uh you know we yep. always we, we always look at folks on the surface whether they're you know we feel like they're successful or not successful but not really understand them as a person and so uh being able to you know do that documentary and and kind of highlight you know the even though folks are on tv or on the radio and are super talented man we're all human beings and we all have the kind of some similar struggles that kind of connect us as human beings so uh, that's awesome right. well said. to kind of well said put that well to the word yeah. No, and to your point, Louise, I just started reading the book, um, The Body Keeps the Score, and it does have a huge theme in how our childhoods kind of depict how our adulthood will be. So maybe how we project our emotions or how we decide and make decisions based on those encounters we have with our first caretakers, our parents, or whomever someone's first caretaker was. <laughs> and that kind of goes back to your desire, not your desire, but your passion for patterns, right? Is how we start mm -hmm. and life we tend to reciprocate in the same way with politics or the same way with how society runs even we tend mm -hmm. to go back and do certain trends all over again or you know there's a lot of pattern and, and harmony i guess or lack thereof sometimes when it comes to how we live life and i know that's one of your interests and you guys have a ton of interests that we can't really cover everything in this one episode but i'd love to pick your guys's brains about astrology and all the fun things because you guys are really sharp but if we were to visit your houses speaking of your interests what kind of pop culture collections would we find oh man you want to start you go me. first it's <laughs> oh i am i'm like a a, a melody harmony geek so I love all the harmony, all the harmony groups and going back to the Mills brothers. And I, I was raised on that and I've got a lot of musical instruments. I've got, uh, I don't know if you can see my shelf, but having worked in radio, you know, a lot of my knickknacks are, are just things that were promotional items, you know, from having covered a, the movie opening or a TV show or something like that. And I, I like to put out on shelves, um, Anything that looks colorful and fun and kitschy or that just gives you a warm feeling. Uh, those are the things that you know, I'm not sure who the decorator is who taught us to like, if it doesn't bring you joy, you know, move it out. But I like to have my home filled with items that give me joy. Like you see the drums behind me and the guitars and uh, yeah, that, that type of pop culture that just makes me feel happy is what you'll find in my, in my home. 
Your turn. In my home, you'll find evidence of a bipolar cat. <laughs> Lots of evidence. I'm, I'm looking at some evidence right now. <laughs> well, I, how do you? I, what are the trails of evidence left behind by a bipolar cat? Well, you, you'll have to use your imagination, but you know it's not pretty. <laughs> I'm a caretaker. A lot of mood swings. And I, I will say, in behalf of Wheezy, uh, that uh, uh, I've met few people in my life who have mentored more children. Uh, through, she does classes, stand-up comedy classes. She's mentored them. She's paid their way through college. She's done so many wonderful things and positively affected the lives of so many children, it would be impossible to count. Those are the things that aren't visible on the surface, but I'm telling you, uh, she's already she's already paid for her condo in heaven over and over again. Aw, that is too yeah. kind. Yeah. Man. Yeah, that's one of my passions is mentoring young, young, young folks and listening. And uh, I don't have kids of my own. And I believe that's why I have the emotional space for the world's children or any child, any child that I encounter, I think that motherhood or parenthood maybe occupies 99% of your nurturing <laughs> bandwidth. And uh, but and so I have a ton to give and, and that's one one area that's extremely important that you know outside of someone's parents they should have someone else who really believes in them and that that's super helpful awesome um and so media path has a big social media presence um where can our viewers find information about the show or find either of you on social media we are, our, our website is called mediapathpodcast.com. You can sign up for our, our newsletter. We'd like to make our newsletter dishy and saucy and sassy and fun. And so uh, mm -hmm. the newsletter comes out just once a week. We don't bother you with anything other than the once a week little newsletter. But we have on Facebook, uh, we're Media Path Pod, at Media Path Podcast. On Twitter, I'm going to continue calling it Twitter. Sorry, Elon. At Media Path Pod <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> in your eye elon at media path pod yeah. almost everywhere and the youtube channel is just media at media path podcast on youtube and if you're just folding laundry or getting groceries put away or whatever just pop it on you glance at the screen if you're curious because it's something that you can listen to and or listen to and and watch and we fill it up with all kinds of fun visuals so you know for example we we did a show on a, a guy that had written a book about the camping trips taken by henry ford thomas edison and john burroughs and there's a bunch of photos of those guys camping in ties. So <laughs> I would love to see it. was super fun. I did not see the tie rack at REI the last time I was in there. So, you know, just... <laughs> but yeah, the YouTube channel is fun. And you, you there's our shows aren't uh, sequential. You can pick out any and they stand alone, whatever interests you. Awesome, awesome. And for our Chief Chat viewers, you can find this episode uh, as well as past Chief Chat episodes on YouTube as well. Uh, so Fritz and Louise, we absolutely loved, you know, having a conversation with you today. I think we, I can probably speak for for both of my co-hosts that, man, we could sit here and really talk about any topic with you all all day long because uh, you, you guys are very introspective and, and, and have, have been through some things in life and have a lot to share and, you know, Anytime I can sit down with a boomer, like I just don't talk. <laughs> I just shut up and listen, right. I just let them go, uh, you know, and 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 just learn. Like you said, there, there's a lot of things that happen that that there's a, you got that experience right, and you can't replace experience. You you can't buy experience, uh, and they're able to share that experience with you. And I just really you know value value uh, learning from other other folks. And so thank you for- Well, for, you, you uh, guys do a great job and make it, us very comfortable to talk. It's it's a great conversation. I mean, this is exactly what we like to do on our show. Just make people comfortable enough to share their true feelings. And you guys are great at that. So thank you so much for inviting us on. It was a blast, Chief. Thanks. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we try to not have the misconception. Most people think if you're military, it's all rigid and kind of formalized. And we just, you know, like, like, like we said earlier, we're all human beings and we like to cut up a little bit. So we appreciate uh, just your, your candor and your, your honest answers and, and just, we appreciate what you're doing for the world. Right. Cause you know, there, there's a, there's a segment uh, uh, of, of, 
I, I think we can all influence somebody, right? And and being able to to put that out there for the world um, uh, via YouTube or wh whatever medium that you choose, uh, you're choosing to pass that information on to other people. And I think uh, knowledge is, is is only powerful if you can pass it on to other folks. And so so thank Aww. you for what you're doing. Uh, yeah, well said. Yes. you guys are amazing. Well, you know, yeah, you guys are awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. So if you don't mind, Be well down there. Yeah, no, go ahead. Mind hanging on. Just... No, oh, go sure. Ahead. Go ahead. For it. I'm just going to say, we'll, we'll, mind, we'll, uh... call you, we'll call you back when Texas gets below 90. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so we'll I, see you I, I in hear, February. I hear from you next year. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what, next March, something like that. So, yeah, yeah, when you know, so. you know, ice storm. No, yeah. no, no. So we, if you don't mind holding on until after the live is over with, kind of, so we can kind of say our formal goodbyes. But I just want to say, again, thank you for making time for us in the military community. We we wish you all well, and uh, and, and and thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thanks thank for you your for service, what you everybody. Do. Thank you for watching. Absolutely. Chief Chat out. <laughs>